sounds from the same pair of mallets using different strokes and striking the bar in different places and then talk about different mallets and what we should try to uh, ask for with young students who don't know right. to get the right effect. Go um, ahead. Get ready, right. He's going to talk a lot. So here we go. Yeah, get ready. Uh, so <laughs> different, well, the biggest difference on bells will be what the mallet is made of. Aluminum that will produce a much different sound than something that will be 
this, this is plastic. Um, bring, bring several of them to play for us so we can get yeah, the difference. This is linen phenelic. I don't actually know what that means, but <laughs> it's kind of in the middle. You get in the middle of the two. You get articulation, but also tone. This is a little harder. They're pretty similar in that way. Like this is the softest one that I have. It's a very soft uh, plastic over a brass core. But there's very little um, articulation. Yeah. If you hit with the faculty concert, this is what I use. that you want the least amount of attack noise and just the tone. So if you would do show us a thing would, would this stand yeah. out so you can see? Would this stand out? <laughs> Anybody see? Oh rip. So for in a situation where you want as little attack as possible and as much tone, what you would want to explain to someone is you start really close to the instrument and just pull up. You don't That that would get the most um, pure tone. Which um, it's honestly so clear that it wouldn't. It's so there's so little articulation that I wouldn't recommend that for an ensemble setting. <coughs> especially with very soloists, because you need the articulation on the instrument to cut through. Um, so probably something like this would be best in this situation. A little harder mallet, similar. Ensemble, I would either choose the black one or the red one. The red one is a little cleaner for me. I like the, yeah. I like you the don't, red one. Especially in this environment, you hear the cleanness more because mm -hmm. that's something you hear close up, but it's not something that carries. Yeah. Unless with a metal mallet, you would hear that from further away, but mm -hmm. a lot of the attack noise doesn't really carry in this environment. Okay. And this is why, uh, yeah. you know, Andrew's been here a long time and he's played in all of our performance venues. So there's times in our rehearsals with the wind ensemble that I will question something and then he will school me on, well, when we're in Schaefer though, this will sound like you want, you want, what you want from the standpoint of the audience, which is great. Because this is a very dead rehearsal space. Any guest conductor that comes, all three of the adults were here for this day, the band that was here for this day. But we've had other people that have come and they come in and they listen to this place like they don't like the, the, this rehearsal space <coughs> because it's so dead. But actually that's great because you get nothing back. And then when you go into any other place, it's always better. Mm -hmm. It's always better. So the sound is even better when you get another place. The nice thing about having a dead place, it's the same thing in a recording studio, totally dead. You can hear every, you can hear the heartbeat. You can hear everything. Okay. Uh, one last thing. Where on the bell, on the bar, on the bar. should we play and why? Um, I would sound. Explain that. Bells, I would always play in the middle. Um, Explain why. Other small size of these bars you don't really the one thing that you should never do is play so you hear some science here the way these things work is this is the part where it vibrates the most these are the secondary points but then here that you get very little vibration these so play uh, all five places on the instrument and so you can we'll hear here you hit in the middle it's a nice resonance
panel creates a resonating cavity, which creates the resonance. If you take the bar out, it still rings, but it's not as a very ringing sound. So that's why you always want to hit in the middle, because then you're hitting in the spot that will activate the most vibrations from the resonating crystal. Mm -hmm. Now, does anybody have any questions about everything? Yeah, same for strings. Yeah. And uh, ju just think, if, if it's like tone versus attack. Uh, if, if you're hitting into the bar, then the mallet is going to be on the bar just a fraction yeah. longer. So you're thinking you're going to hear more <coughs> of a hit than a resonance. So if you lift out, then then the, there's less contact, yeah. less time that the mallet. Just think of it as an articulation bar. against the meat, mm -hmm. an articulation against the roof of your mouth. Think of it that way, mallet against the bar. Yeah, even with these really soft. Vibraphone, marimba, um, you can get away with hitting on the edges of a little more because it's a much more similar sound. Um, the bar is kind of actually good, as I, <laughs> as I mentioned. And that, that's especially yeah. true when you're playing like four mallets. Yeah, so, so that way you don't have to play a chord like this to play it in the middle. You can play on the edge yeah. and keep it all in here. With so the, with the larger bars, playing full mallet strings on vibraphone and marimba, out of practicality, sometimes you have to. Or um, if you have a fast lick or something, um, playing on a hit yeah, if you hit on the edge instead of going all the way to the middle. Um, but because there's a lot of other tones that you're playing, yeah, you don't really hear. It's kind of more economy of motion than sound choice. If you if you have the ability, play in the middle. Yeah. But if it's more physically practical to play on the edge, then it's really not that. Yeah, it's not really something that you would notice here and there. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, when you're working with young kids and you're teaching them the very beginnings <coughs> of uh, bells or glockenspiel, which is probably what you'll have for your young percussionist, then I would also encourage you to get them to take piano lessons. That would be really wonderful. Uh, and have a philosophical talk about what percussion instrument should you start at the beginning of a, of a, a student's career. Should you start them on snare drum and drum kit and all these things, or should they all play bells and play the same music that everybody else in the class plays? Um, anyway, uh, they're going to be playing one note at a time. So Andrew's technique of showing you this, this is really good to know, because if you expect your clarinets and your trombones and your trumpets and your flutes, all of which you will start, uh, to play with the best possible tone, then you should obviously expect <coughs> your percussion to play the best possible tone that they should play with it, too. Okay. Now, on another day, let's do all the non-pitch percussion. And you can talk to us about where to strike the head, where and how and why to the different sounds. Because I'm not sure that they're, you know, I want to make sure that they understand this before we go yeah. to student teach. Because I'm, with every student teacher, they're not, they're, it's not their forte. Yeah. Okay, two more minutes.
This is a general note. <coughs> Whenever a small amount of uh, people, especially at corners, have the melody, we're playing the wrong way, and it's low in this section, so I'm giving it probably a double, maybe triple forte, and this is not coming out the way you guys are like, and I can tell that it wasn't <laughs> quite enough. I don't know about Aaron. It sounds good to me. <laughs> but just keep in mind, uh, if you have a small amount of horns, don't try and make them uh, play too terribly loud. You aren't doing that with me, but if uh, you have younger kids, they're not going to be able to handle it. Just but like the volume we're, we're playing with, But most horns, uh, if whenever you're teaching them, tell them to play one dynamic level higher than what's written, because like I said, we're going that way. Okay. Um, you were right to not want to try to back off. I think that you, the verbiage you choose is fitting to X player and X player's sound. It's a better um, way to think, for to get players to think about who they're listening to. Um, and also, there was this one thing we did. I don't know if you guys realized we did it, but it caught me off guard. It was like three of the session. Wait, you're going to back up? And I was like, what just happened? Yeah. yeah. Oops. That was, that's a nitpicky thing, but it like really, it distracted me. I was like, whoa. I really like how your interaction and communication it's is today. That's it's really wonderful. Uh, something that I think that would help 
is to foreshadow the changes a little bit sooner. There was a point where you didn't, your face didn't say that there was a crescendo until it was already halfway done. So I feel like if you had put it on the other end, halfway before, well, not halfway before, but a beat or two before, then I feel like that crescendo would have been much more effective. 